All right, so we started section 2.4 last time, and we had done one example, and the example we did was about solving triangles. Um, so solving triangles means finding all of the angles and the sides in a triangle. Um, the, the information we have to be given in order to do that is three pieces of information. And it always kind of looks like it's two because the right angle is one of those pieces. So the right angle itself is a, a piece of information that there's a right triangle. And then we've got two other pieces of information. So on this one, we had the angle 47 down here on the bottom right, and we had the hypotenuse 89.6. So those are the three pieces of information we were given. Um, so generally speaking, you can be given one of two things. You can either be given an angle and a side, like this one was, or you can be given, like on this one, two sides. And they can be any two sides to work with, okay? So I wanted to do a, an example of both of those types. This one is actually not drawn in either. Um, so we're gonna draw this one to start with. So we're going to draw in a triangle. Oops, lines. Um, our triangle is a right triangle. It tells us that and also that's all we've been working with so far. We will work with some other things that are not right triangles eventually, but we're not there yet. Um, the right triangle has this corner, um, right? This 90 degree angle. And this is what we're gonna always call C. Um, the side opposite it is always going to have the same letter, but in lower case, this is lower letter, lowercase letter C. Um, and then we can put our A and our B wherever we wish. I'm going to put my A on the bottom, which means the side opposite is letter A over here. And I'm going to put my angle B on the top, so the side opposite the angle B is side B on the bottom. Now they give us two other pieces of information that we will fill in. They tell us that B is 32, so that's down here now. And they tell us that C is 51, so that's up here now. And with those two pieces of information, I can find both angles and the missing side, which is what I need to do. So let's start with the missing side. How do I find the missing side when I have two sides given? Pythagorean theorem, right? We've been doing that for a while, um, and you've done that prior to coming to see me as well. Uh, we do need to make sure we get them in, in the right places. So our sides are A and 32. And then our hypotenuse is the 51. So we have a squared plus 32 squared equals 51 squared. So grab your calculator if you don't have it out just yet. And we are going to square 32 and square 51. So what is 32 squared? 1,024. Is that right? Okay. What is 51 squared? 2,601. Okay, what would we do next? Subtract. So we're going to subtract that 1024 to both sides. I have A squared left on the left. And then what is 2601 minus 1024? Excellent. 1,577. And the directions, let's just go back to them real quick, says that we're going to do the length to two decimal places. So I need to find one more thing here. What do I need to do? I'll need to do a square root. And typically speaking, we keep things exact, but this problem told us that we're going to round. So we don't need to find the exact value of the square root of 1577 broken down into you know, perfect squares and pulled out. That's not what it's asking for in this problem. It wants an approximation. So your calculator will be able to do that for us just fine. So if you take the square root of 1577, what is that two decimal places? 39.71. And then what are my units on this problem? This is feet. Okay, so this is the missing side. You can write it in if you'd like. So this is 39.71, if that's helpful for you to see it there. We've got all three sides. Um, now we need to find some angles. We need to find angle A and we need to find angle B, capital A, capital B. So angle A, I'm going to start with angle A. Uh, if I wanted to find angle A, and I don't want to use the 39.71 for a couple of reasons. Number one, if I made an error, then I'll make more errors, right? So using the information that's given instead of the information that I just found is helpful when I can do so. Okay, so I kind of like to not use that piece of information. The other reason that I would kind of like to not use that piece of information is because there's decimal points with that value, and my other two don't have any, so they're easier to work with. So if I use the 32 and the 51 that I'm given, what trig function relates the 32, the 51, and angle A? Cosine. So the next piece I'm going to be doing is going to be the cosine of angle A. If 
you want to call it theta, you can, but A is specifically the one we're working with here. And it is the adjacent side, which is 32, over the hypotenuse, which is 51. Now, at this point, it looks like something we've done before. We, I mean, we've done all of this before. We just haven't done it all together. Um, but we did this back in Chapter 1 as well. How do we find angle A when the cosine of A is on the left and these fraction is on, this fraction is on the right? We do the inverse function. We talked about it more extensively in Section 2-3. If I want to find angle A, I have to do the inverse cosine function. So I've got the inverse cosine of 32 over 51. And again, your calculator will treat that just fine, no problem. So if you do inverse cosine of 32 over 51, and the directions again at the top said that we're rounding to the nearest tenth of a degree, what is angle A? Okay, and tenth of a degree is one, one decimal, so 0.1, is that what you have? Okay, 51.1. Is that okay? Yes? Okay. Um, so the easiest way, if I know this 51.1 how at this point now, how can I find angle B? Subtract it. Subtract. What am I going to subtract? From 90. Yeah. So the two angles that are not my 90 degree angle have to add up to 90. Right? A triangle has 180 degrees, the 90 angle is already taken care of, so the two angles, the, the acute angles, have to add up to 90. So I'll write it out very clearly, but angle A plus angle B, right? We'll do it like this. Now, you know what? I used angle before, so I'm going to use this. Like that. Angle A plus angle B is, is 90. The, these two are adding to 90. So if I want to find angle B, it's going to be 90 minus that 51.1 that I just found. And what is 90 minus 51.1? Mm-hmm, 38.9. And if you wanted to confirm that using the information given, because I mentioned that before, right? Like, what if we made a mistake business? You could do the same thing for angle B. You would just say that the sine of B is going to be 32 over 51. And angle B would be the inverse sine of 32 over 51. So for good measure, let's just find that. Go ahead and do inverse sine 32 over 51. Right, and it's sine because we're looking at the opposite over the hypotenuse when we're talking about angle B. Does it give you 38.9? Excellent. When you round it, yeah, because we're asked to round. So we get the same thing whether we do subtraction from 90 or whether we do the cosine or the sine function for the other one. So we have a couple options on verifying for ourselves. Okay, any questions on solving triangles? So again, one of two forms is what you're given. You're either given an angle and a side, like you were on one, or you're given two sides, and they might be the two sides that are the legs, or they might be a leg and a hypotenuse, it doesn't matter. You do it all the same way, um, but you're given two legs and asked to find the remaining sides and angles. All right, let's take a look at another one. So these are some applications um, with those triangles, like direct applications. They involve us um, probably drawing a little bit of picture, maybe of what's going on. So we have, suppose that we have an angle of elevation of the sun and it's 23.4 degrees. We're going to find the length of the shadow cast by Diane Carr, who is five feet, nine inches tall. So we've got the sun. It has to be drawn in yellow, obviously. At least on my screen, because I've got yellow. You probably don't have yellow with you, but it's the sun, so it should be yellow. And we've got Diane Carr, so here she is. That's as good as my pictures of people get right there, okay? And the sun is shining down on Diane Carr, and as the sun shines down on her, we'll use this one right here. As the sun shines down on her like this, it casts a shadow on the ground, right? So her, her shadow is down here. That red is not good. Let's do the yellowy white. Okay, so there's her shadow, right? So this is the shadow. Um, and it tells us some information like with some numbers. Um, so let's actually start at the beginning. 
The first thing it talks about is an angle of elevation. So the angle of elevation is always from the horizontal up to something. So in our case, it's from the horizontal up to the sun. It's right here. What was our number? 23.4. Okay, so this is our angle of elevation right here in this corner. Okay. Uh, the next thing it tells us is how tall Diane Carr is. It says she's five feet nine inches, and that's not a very friendly um, unit to be working in because it's got units of feet and inches. Does that make sense to everybody? We gotta have one or the other, and it doesn't really even matter which one you use. Um, typically in the problem, um, if you're working inside of my math lab, it's probably going to tell you how long is the shadow in feet or how long is the shadow in inches. Um, but if it didn't, then either answer is going to be able to show up as a possibility that would work. Okay. This one does not tell us, so I'm going to let you guys pick. Do you want to turn her into feet, like her height, or do you want to turn her height into inches? Inches. Inches. Okay, Melody is very clear she wants to do inches, so we're going to do inches. All right, so five feet, nine inches. Well, the nine inches is already in inches. How do I get the five feet into inches? Five times 12. Five times 12. So there are 12 inches in a foot. So we would have, how tall is Diane Carr in inches? 69. She is 69 inches tall. So that gives us a 69 over here on our triangle. Right there. Now, we have to set it up, granted. But this is easier than the last two problems because we're not asked to find every side and angle in the triangle. We're asked to find one of them, correct? <coughs> so we don't have to find three things, we only have to find one thing. So what will relate the, 50, the 69, the 23.4, and the shadow? What trig function will relate those three together? It will be tangent, correct. Tangent of an angle, I'm just gonna remind you, is opposite over adjacent. So our angle <clears throat> is 23.4 degrees. What's the opposite? 69. And the adjacent is the thing we don't know, so put a variable in it for it. Call it A if you want, but I just called mine X. So pick, pick a letter. Yeah. What am I going to do to solve this? It's a great question. It's a great question. Okay, so generally speaking, the answer is I need to get X by itself, right? Yeah. Everybody good with that? That's, that's the general thing that you should be able to say without knowing necessarily how to do it. You should know that's the goal. Is everybody good with that? Goal is to get X by itself. The difficult thing, or at least the messy thing about the way this is set up is that the X is in the denominator. Okay? Yeah, so Isaiah is right. So first thing we need to do is get it out of the denominator. So we're going to multiply it to the other side. And I'll show it in a couple of steps just in case your, your um, algebra is a little bit... Um, distant for you. The first thing we're going to do is multiply by my x. But then I want the x that's no longer in the denominator now to stand alone. I want it to be by itself, which means everything that's beside it needs to move and be divided to the other side. So we're going to divide by the tangent of 23.4 degrees. And all of that calculation is something your calculator will do just fine. So you can type in 69, and then you can divide by tangent of 23.4 degrees. And I don't have this answer in inches, so somebody's going to have to tell me what you get, because I did mine on my paper in feet. <coughs> uh, it doesn't say, um, so let's just go with whole numbers, because we don't have an inclination. What do you get? Oh, it's a bunch. What do you got? 159. Is that it? Okay, so, and that's for a whole number. And if it told me decimals, I would put decimals, right? So what are my units on this then? This would be my inches units, okay? So we have 159 inches. That's the length of the shadow. Um, and if you had done it in feet, let me just make a mark over here to note it, this because I did it in feet on my paper. I have 13.29 feet, okay? So we could have changed her height into feet. How would we have done that? I mean, like we multiplied five times 60 to get it into inches. What would we have had to have done if we wanted to put it in feet? We have to do the nine, which is an in inches divided by 12 instead, okay? Or you could turn it into inches and then at the end here, what could we do to turn this back into feet? 
You divide by 12 here, right? Somewhere along the way, you're going to divide by 12. So you could divide the answer we just got by 12. Yes? How, did, how are you supposed to know that um, your calculator needs to be in degree mode for that? Yeah, it, it's in degree mode because they gave us the degree as the measure. So most of what we're doing in trig will be in degree mode. Um, not everything. And when you get to calculus, everything will be in radians. Everything. We don't work with degrees at all in calculus. So, All right. Number four. The angle of inclination from the base of the John Ho Hancock Center to the top of the main structure of the Sears Tower is approximately 10.3 degrees. If the main structure of the Sears Tower is 1,451 feet tall, how far apart are the two skyscrapers? And it says to assume that the bases of the two buildings are at the same elevation. Um, that's kind of important. It sort of seems like a, why did they need to say that statement? But depending on where you live, especially, that might be something that's not a given. Um, so there are places where you go where the, ang the elevation of things, Seattle, we were in Seattle this summer. Oh my word. Talk about hills within the city. Um, every building, I think, is at a different elevation. It's very, very different. Oklahoma's not like that. So that's why they're putting this in here in particular, because anybody potentially would be reading this problem from anywhere. So we have two buildings. So we're gonna draw two buildings first. So here's building number one, and here's building number two. And they're different heights, evidently, right? They're at the same elevation. So that means that this down here is on the same level, um, ground level. All right, so it says the angle of inclination from the base of John Hopkins to the top of the Sears Tower. So the way that I've drawn mine is that here's my John Hopkins one, and here's my Sears Tower. So angle of inclination says that it's incline, like an incline, right? Like if it's an incline, it means you're going up. So we're t this picture is terrible in terms of it being to scale. So forgive that, but I don't want to take up too much space to draw either. So we're taking this right here angle. So clearly this angle is not 10.3, but it doesn't really matter. It's just space holding force, right? So the angle of inclination from the bottom, right, from the ground level of John Hopkins up to the top of the Sears Tower is 10.3 degrees. What else do they give us? The height of the Sears Tower. So the height of the Sears Tower, pretty high, 1,451 feet. And what are we looking for? The distance between, right? We're looking for that part on the bottom. So this piece right here is what we're looking for. I'll call it D. You can call it whatever you like. But it's this length right here that I need to find. Yeah, it'll be tangent again. And they're not all tangent, but a lot of them with application like this will be actually. So we've got this one, D on bottom. We've got the side 15, 1451. We've got the angle 10.3 degrees. This is another tangent problem. So the tangent of my 10.3 degrees is going to equal 1,451 divided by x, or d. I use d here. OK, so what are our steps? What do we do? Yeah, it kind of looks like the x or the d. The, it flips with the tangent, right? So d comes over on the left. Tangent, tangent gets divided to the right. And what is 1451 divided by tangent of 10.3 degrees? Yeah, and since it doesn't tell us, we're just going to round to the whole, that whole number for this one. And it's feet, right? So it's almost 8,000 feet between the two. That's pretty far apart, OK? So my picture is definitely not to scale. We knew that to begin with. Um, but it is about 8,000 feet apart between the two. All right, you ready to look at another application of trig? OK, there's applications to trig and navigation. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but it's something that you should know. Um, bearings is an application um, of our trigonometry. So in navigation and surveying, the term bearing is used to specify the location of one point relative to another. So you've got some space on the bottom of your page. Don't turn it just yet. We're going to draw a couple pictures. So if I have 
this point right here, and I have this point right here. And I'm going to call them O and P, All right? So think about navigation. We're talking ships in the sea, right? This is what we're doing. There's two locations. Um, you know, the ships are in two different locations. And the question is, you know, where are they apart? Um, and knowing the distance isn't enough. I mean, if we just tell them, oh, we're, we're, we're 1,000 feet away, well, 1,000 feet, where, which direction? That doesn't help me, right? Like, it doesn't help me fully. I mean, I could be 1,000 feet in any direction away and, and not get to there if I'm trying to arrive from one point to the next. So the way that this is done is that we use um, north, south, east, and west as our bearings, right? So compasses, things like that. And so the way we do this is we talk about, well, we're, we're going to go from O to P. So we're going to imagine that we're at O and we're going to P, all right? And so there's two different directions in terms of north, south, east, and west that we need to go. We need to go some north and we need to go some west. Agreed? We need to go some distance north and some distance west if we're talking about the direction we are. Now, we may not literally go north and go west. We may go in a straight line, but we may not. There may be an <laughs> island in between us, and we got to go around it too, okay? So, but knowing where we are distance-wise is what we're looking for. So in particular, we always specify the north or the south that we're going first, okay? This one's going north, so I'm just going to write down north. And then after we go north, like directionally speaking, we specify the second um, direction, east or west. And in this case, we're going west. So there's, this is north and this is west. Okay? What goes in between is the <coughs> angle that we go from the north to the west. So picture-wise, over here, this right here, angle, is what we put in between the north and the west. So I'm just going to make one up. I'm going to use 40. So if this angle is 40, we would say that this is north, 40 degrees west. It's how we report a bearing. Okay, so this is one of those things you don't get to change because you didn't create the system and people already use it, right? You work within the system that was created. So let's try another one. Let's say that we're going like this now. So same thing, but the O is up. Actually, no, let's just do P and O again. Let's say now we're talking about going from P to O, okay? Well, if we're going from P to O, now we have to go south, correct? And then we have to go east, so we're coming this direction. And this angle right here, which would be 40 as well, okay? If, if these are actually the same points, O and P, which I've kind of alluded to them being that way, this would be south 40 degrees east. Is that okay? No, it's not okay? It's okay. All right. So let's take a look um, at drawing what these would look like roughly. And we're not going to get protractors out or compasses. We're not doing anything like that. That's not our goal. Um, we're just getting a ballpark picture of what's happening in terms of the directions, okay? So if we're looking at south 50 degrees west, so my first point is going to be here. And if I go south, that means I would go down, right? So I'm going to go south. And then west would be going left. So I'm going to go from here, I'm going to go left. So it's going to be an angle like this. And what goes right here? Well, 50. Right? So this is south, 50 degrees west. The next one says I'm going to go north first. So north would be up on your picture. And then it says I'm going to go east. It's right. And this is obviously not drawn to scale again. None of mine are, but this would be my 13 degrees. Does that make sense? We're looking for general idea. Do we understand north, south, east, and west with the angle measures going on? That's what our goal is. Um, they're going to show you um, in some of your stuff an actual picture, right? Kind of like I showed you these pictures from the get-go, they're going to show you a picture like this, and you're going to write this value down. Um, and then we're also going to see ones where they give you the information and you draw something that matches that, or maybe it's a multiple choice one where you pick which one matches it. All right. I think this is our last application in this section. Yeah, it is. So we're going to look at simple harmonic motion. So this one requires a little bit more setup. It's not as 
it's not difficult. There's just a lot more setup to it than like bearings was. So an object that's on a coordinate axis and is in simple harmonic motion, if its distance from the origin d at time t is given by either d equals a cosine, that w is, in, is the Greek letter omega, omega t, or d equals a sine omega t. The motion has the amplitude a, that's something we've seen before. And that's the magnus, maximum displacement of the object from its rest position. It's how far away it goes. The period of the motion is 2 pi divided by omega. That's how we find period. So that's no different, right? So the period is found in the same way. The period gives the time it takes for the motion to go through one cycle. And I don't have this written down in a note here, so we're going to add it on because I know that you're going to have some questions that ask about this. Yeah. I don't know if it's have one written down on our stuff or not. We'll add it in. Frequency is actually omega over 2 pi. And it's how often... Um, the cycle repeats. That's probably not a very good description, but we're going to go with it. How often the cycle repeats. Okay, so it's just the flip, it's the reciprocal of the period. So the period and the frequency are reciprocals of one another. Okay, you ready to look at some examples? Okay. So um, there's lots of images you can do. The one that keeps coming to my mind when I think about this is, do you know the, the balls where you pull one to the side and it bumps and it mocks, mocks it this way and it keeps bumping back and forth? Y'all know what I'm talking about? That would be simple harmonic motion, right? There's a distance that it goes that's furthest away and then there's a distance that it goes furthest away and that's the amplitude. And the length of time it takes to do this is the frequency and the period um, interchangeably, okay? Um, so the period, how, fre how frequently it does it, and the, t the frequency is how often, how long it takes to do it. So um, another one that they're going to do is our first example, and it's springs. So an object is attached to a coil spring. Okay, so imagine you've got a spring, and you have two options. Either the spring can just be at rest, and it might be kind of bouncing, right? Like it's something that's weighing it down. Or perhaps... You're like a child and you're like, I'm going to grab to it and I'm going to yank it down and then it's going to bounce up and down after that. Are you with me? Those are kind of the two options of what can happen here. So on this one, the object is pulled down six inches from rest. So it's going to be pulled down and then it's going to be let, let go. Can you picture that happening with a spring? It's kind of important to be able to picture at least a little bit of what's going on. Okay. And it tells you it's pulled down six inches from rest and released. It has an amplitude of six inches and a period of four seconds. So a couple of things here is that the um, formulas that we're working with, actually, let me write them at the top of the screen here, are either going to be y equals, I think we use d, yep, d, no, d equals, that's what their d is, d equals a cosine omega t, or d equals a sine omega t. Because think about what's the difference between sine and cosine graphs. <coughs> one, starts one starts at the top, right, and one starts at the origin. Everybody with me on that? We've talked a lot about graphs in sections 2, 1, and 2, 2. One starts at the top, one starts at the origin. So one, the origin one, is at rest when it starts. The other one is at a distance away when it starts. That's what this one is. Right? It is pulled a distance away. It is not at rest when, it, when the problem starts. Something has actually pulled it away from its resting position. We're dealing, in this case, with, with the cosine function because the cosine one has been pulled away from the origin. Okay? So the, this particular one is cosine. So we're going to be doing the function d equals a cosine omega t. And the reason, I'm going to jot this in your notes too so that you look back at later and you decide, how did we decide, is because D, or the coil, actually I say it that way, 
the coil starts pulled away, right? It starts away from its resting position. So this is going to be cosine. How far away has it been pulled? Six. And it's being pulled down. So we're going to represent that as negative six, right? If it were being pulled up, we would represent it as positive six. So our D here, I'm sorry, our, our D, our A here is going to be six and negative because it's pulled down. Um, when we talk about the amplitude, we talk about it being absolute value, it's a distance, but the value within the equation can certainly be a negative number. Yes. Yeah. All right. The other thing that we need to know is we need to know how to deal with the omega, because that's the only other variable, right? Like if I rewrite this now, I've got d equals negative 6 cosine omega t. Omega needs to not be there, right? So I've got a variable on the left. That's typical. I've got one variable t on the right. That's typical. I don't want the omega. I need to figure out what is omega. Everybody with me? Okay, we got to figure out what is omega. So our period, that is how long does it take for this to do this? Well, the period is found by taking 2 pi and dividing it by omega. That's the formula for period. And it tells us what the period is. The period is 4 seconds, right? So this thing is equal to 4. So I should be able to use this equation then and figure out what in the world is omega. So this is kind of like the last two problems we did with tangent, right? Where I need to multiply by the omega and then I need to divide by the four. Same thing. So I will, well, first I will shrink all this because it's just taking up too much space. Okay, so first I will multiply by the omega. So that leaves me with two pi equals four omega, and then I will divide by four. So what is omega? It's pi over two, yeah. It's two pi over four, which would reduce to pi over two. That's omega. So the question asked me, um, I don't know if it even asked it here, we're, yes, at the very beginning, it says write an equation for the distance of the object from rest after t seconds. So the distance is going to equal negative six cosine of omega, which is pi over 2 times t. This is the equation that relates all of these details together. Okay? I think there's two pieces of this that make things a little bit complicated. First, you've got to figure out which one you're dealing with, sine or cosine, right? That's an easy place to make a mistake. So if you're getting something wrong, double check. Did I really make sure that I got the right trig function? And the second thing is actually finding the period, right? Making sure you're not like taking the four and just putting that in for omega or something like that, right? You've actually got to solve for omega with the information given. Okay, we've got another example that's like this. You ready? Okay. This one is that an object is propelled downward from its rest position. Okay, so it's not pulled and then let go. It's like pushed away sort of like after the time starts. So given that it is propelled downward, we're dealing with this one being a sine function. It starts at rest and then for you know, some other force is acting upon it and pushes it downward. Okay, and then the, you know, this, the time starts when it's being pushed downward. So this propelled downward business tells us that we're dealing with the sine function. Is everybody all right with that? This one's going to be a sine function. So we have d equals um, a sine omega t. All right. It says that it is uh, propelled downward with its rest from its rest position at time t equals zero. And then it says with an amplitude of five inches, so we know that it's five, um, but like Isaiah mentioned, amplitude is a positive quantity. So the A that we're putting in may be five or it may be negative five, depending upon the description that we're given. 
So just because it says five for the amplitude does not mean A puts in as five, right? The A value itself could have a sign on it. This one is being propelled how? Downward. So our A value here is also going to be a negative. Okay, so this downward <laughs> pr uh, pr propulsion, this word right here, tells us that this A is a negative five. So now we have negative five sine omega t. And then it tells us that it has a period of 2.5 seconds. Okay, so period is always 2 pi over omega, and it tells us that this is 2.5. Okay, so we did one like this already before. What do I need to do? Multiply by the denominator omega. So now I have 2 pi equals 2.5 omega. And then what? Mm -hmm. Divide by 2.5. Now, admittedly, this is not a very friendly looking fraction, and we are not going to leave it as 2 pi over 2.5. That's not going to be okay. Yeah. Um, this 2.5 can turn into a whole number a couple of different ways, but the simplest one would be to multiply it by 2. What's 2.5 times 2? Five. So if I multiply this denominator by 2 and the numerator then by 2, I'm going to get 4 pi over 5. So my omega is 4 pi over 5. Okay, so we do want to represent things without decimals intermixed with fractions. That's not a good notation. So back over here to our problem. This is d equals negative 5 sine 4 pi over 5 t. That's our, our function. Uh, yes, T is our angle that we're working with. So, because we're talking, because we're talking about time in these problems, yeah. All right, one more problem. The directions are going to be given to us backwards of what we've just been doing. Okay, so we have an object. It's moving in simple harmonic motion. We've actually got the equation given to us this time, whereas before we were finding it. Um, it says T is measured in seconds. D is in inches. A, we're going to find the maximum displacement. B, frequency. That's when I realized I'd forgotten to include that in the notes. Sorry about that. And then C is the time required for one cycle. Okay, everybody good? Okay, so I think you could probably find the maximum displacement like in about a second. What's the maximum displacement? It's 10, right? So A, the amplitude is the maximum displacement. It's 10. And if it had said negative 10, the answer would still be 10 because the displacement is a positive quantity just like amplitude is a positive quantity. So part A for this one, right, is that it's 10. That's my maximum displacement. Um, and it's actually given in, what did it say, inches? So this would be 10 inches. Okay, 10 inches is the farthest it is moving away from its resting position. position. Okay, so B, the frequency. So we had a formula for frequency. We haven't used it yet. But the frequency is the period formula flipped upside down, right? So instead of 2 pi over omega, it is omega over 2 pi. All good? Okay. We know omega, right? Before we were looking for omega, but we know omega. It's in the problem. What is omega? It's 4 pi. So omega is the value that is being multiplied by t here. So this piece is omega. So my omega is 4 pi. And if I divide 4 pi by 2 pi, what do I get? This is 2. My frequency is 2. What does it mean? Well, it means that this is going to have two cycles per second. And the reason it's per second is because what are the units given in the problem? It's inches and seconds, right? It says seconds. So it's two cycles per second. And C, the period... We'll just take this 2 pi over omega, so we're flipping it upside down. So I have 2 pi over 4 pi. You can write it or you can just use it from the, time, the fact that you already have the 2. What is 2 pi over 4 pi, or what is the reciprocal of the 2 we just got in part B? 1 half. This should be 1 half. So frequency and periods are reciprocals. So the reciprocal of 2 is 1 half here. So this is 1 half. And what are the units? seconds. Very good. This is one half seconds. So it's telling you that it will 
repeat this cycle. There's two cycles in every two seconds, or it's telling you that one cycle, um, one period of this takes one half of a second, right? One cycle or one period is one half of a second. Any questions on those? Say again louder, Brielle. Part C again. So part C is our period. The period is always given as two pi over omega. Omega is our four pi, okay? So when we have two pi divided by four pi, the pi's are gonna cancel just like they would have in the previous one. And if I reduce two over four, I get one half. So I'm gonna get a one half. The period is always how long something takes and the units in this particular problem are seconds. So this is one half of a second for it to do one period um, of a rotation of this um, cycle of whatever we're doing, cycle four coil or whatever it is, okay? All right, we will stop there for today.